Thank you, Dean Shackelford, distinguished guests, and most importantly, the graduates. It's an honor and a privilege to address you today. I'm an adopted Tar Heel. I live in the state, I work in the state, and I absolutely love it here. My son, who's in the wings, is an undergraduate here at UNC in the Keenan Flagler Business School. So count me in as deeply invested in the continued success of this elite institution. PPD and UNC have a symbiotic relationship that goes back decades. More than 300 UNC grads are employed by PPD, and we have hired 90 in the last two years. We rely on 10 Keenan Flagler MBA graduates in our executive ranks, and their average tenure has been over 10 years with us. This prestigious business school has been a bedrock of talent for the past and continued success of PPD. A nod to the families. I'd like to recognize the families of the graduates for your unwavering support that has enabled these graduates to be positioned to make such a positive impact on the society around us. Graduates, we're here to honor you, and we're here to celebrate your significant achievement. You're receiving a master's in business administration from one of the premier institutions of business learning in the world the Keenan Flagler Business School. Let's all give the graduates a great round of applause. Before I get into the heart of my talk, let me share a little bit of information about my company and about myself. PPD was founded by Dr. Fred Eshelman 30 years ago. Dr. Eshelman is a graduate of UNC and the largest benefactor of the School of Pharmacy. I joined PPD three years ago as chairman and CEO after the company was privatized by the Carlisle Group and Hellman and Friedman, two of the leading private equity companies in the world. We're a leader in clinical research. We employ 14,000 people across 45 countries. We truly are a global enterprise. As you heard, we execute clinical research and laboratory services to support the regulatory filings for innovative new drug candidates. Our mission is to help our biopharmaceutical customers improve the productivity of their research and development investments. And in by doing that, we bring more medicines to the patients who need them around the world. Prior to joining PPD, I spent 15 years at Pfizer most recently as president of the Emerging Markets and Established Products Business Units. These business units combine for approximately $20 billion of Pfizer's annual sales. I'm a mathematician by background, and I started my career designing computer software for the steel industry. It's been quite a journey from my start in the steel industry to the CEO of a life sciences company. By sharing the key lessons I've learned during this journey, I hope to give you some valuable advice about your future career decisions that will increase your probabilities of achieving great career success and personal happiness. I asked Laura Otten, 2015 MBA graduate, how I could be most helpful to all of you. From this conversation flowed three questions that I hope to answer from my own experience. The first one, how did I navigate my own career crossroads? The second one, how do I choose the right people to be on my team? And third, what other advice could I give to help you as you make and manage your own career transitions? So first, how I navigated my career transitions. Looking back on 30 years of my career, I have five rules that have guided my career choices. The first is, I always thought about my career as a 30-year journey. For those that might have a mathematical background, I was seeking to optimize a 30-year equation. This is very different than optimizing a two or three year equation. You'll likely make better decisions if you take the long view and you're building towards the long view than you would if you were just looking at any decision you make in isolation. Don't wake up 20 years from now and look back on a set of random career choices. Each decision you make needs to build towards an end goal. It's okay if your end goal isn't precisely clear at this stage. It's even more important, if that's the case, to follow the next rule that I use. This is rule two. I actively look to acquire the best development experiences without bouncing around too much. Finance, operations, technology, human resources, strategy, 
marketing and sales, working in different geographies around the world. Try as much as you can. When you break through to your first P&L ownership role for a sizable organization, you will be better able to lead if you have a broad set of experiences across the functions you're going to lead and manage. A personal story. I worked for four companies across three industries, and I lived and worked in five countries along the way. I spent six years learning information technology, three years managing manufacturing facilities, three years in marketing and strategy, seven years mastering general management and leading large, complex organizations. My longest tenure in an assignment was four and a half years, not so long, and it still took me 25 years to gain the skills and experiences needed to tackle the CEO role at PPD. I lived and worked in Japan, England, Greece, Canada, and the U.S. I'm a more effective leader for these experiences. If you aspire to the CEO role of a firm, bear this in mind. Also, think about your ideal learning cycle. What's the amount of time you need to squeeze the most learning out of an experience? Mine was three to four years. You should think about this. Don't shortchange yourself and move too quickly if you're in a really good learning, learning process. Also, don't get stuck in the same role for too long, um, unless it's really the role of your dreams, and it's OK. Keep learning and growing. Rule three, the people I worked with and for are as important as the companies I work for. So another way to say this is don't be too enamored by a glitzy name of a company. If you got a chance to work for a great leader, you should jump on it. You'll be better off joining a great leader in a small company than a bad leader in a blue chip company. I would never take a job if I wasn't completely sold on the leader I'd be reporting into. And I worked for some excellent leaders at Pfizer. I learned a lot from these leaders about the art and science of leadership and management. As a secondary benefit, they became great advocates for my own career development. I took the CEO job at PPD for a variety of reasons, and a major one was I really liked the folks at Carlisle and Hellman and Friedman who would serve on my board. Who you work for and with is not to be underestimated in your growth and development as a leader. Rule four, I determine my personal appetite for risk and never let my career pursuits negatively impact my family. Make sure your aspirations and decision framework are in line with your personal risk profile. My risk profile was always high, although I never made a move without my wife being 100% on board with the decision. I moved from the steel industry in the US to the pharmaceutical industry in Europe. I took a, ba a step backwards in Pfizer to directly lead a marketing organization so I could improve my depth of knowledge in pharmaceutical marketing. Could I have gotten lost in that move? Absolutely. But I didn't. And that step allowed me to prove myself, gain skills that led to a promotion running all of Eastern Europe. My advice, don't be afraid to fail. Make sure you gather experiences, make sure you're working for the right people, and calibrate yourself with your own personal risk appetite. The fifth rule is I look for opportunities to stand out. When I became country president of Greece for Pfizer, there was little expectation inside the company that the business could be a significant contributor of sales and profit. I saw greater potential through some simple analytics about the market size for a handful of Pfizer's products. Seeing the potential of that business that others missed made the opportunity that much more attractive for me. It was a chance to distinguish myself. The business grew from 100 million in sales a year to over 450 million in sales a year in just five years. This performance statement was my launch pad for my career at Pfizer. Being clever and having great rhetorical abilities will only get one so far. In the end, we must deliver significant value for our enterprises. So to summarize this first question, one, look at your career in the long term. Look at it as an optimization equation over a 30-year career. Don't overweight any one decision. Two, gather experiences, as many as you can. This will enable you to lead the functions as you'll have a direct experience with them. Push yourself out of your comfort zone from time to time and consider living and working abroad. Three, look for new roles based on where you can best learn and grow, not just the company's brand name. Overweight the opportunity to work for a great leader. Fourth, define your own personal risk appetite and stay true to it. And fifth, build a resume of definitive performance statements. Statements that ha people, have their, people have their heads being scratched saying, how did that happen? 
And when your leadership was causal and the outcomes delivered, always make sure you're adding value to your organization and stand out. I want to share the story from my most recent career transition to illustrate how I use this framework. Why did I choose to leave Pfizer after 15 years and great success to become the chairman and CEO of PPD? First, my aspiration was clear. I wanted to test myself as a CEO. By 2010, I felt I had the experience and capability to tackle such a significant responsibility and leadership challenge. PPD was an opportunity to test myself now as opposed to waiting maybe five years to compete for the CEO role at Pfizer. In other words, I wanted to gather experiences and didn't want to get too stagnant in my current role. I was impressed with the quality of the private equity partners who would be my board members. Remember the rule about focusing on who we'll be working with as being as important as the company we're working for. Finally, regarding risk appetite, I was always willing to take measured risk to move forward and learn and grow. In this case, though, the decision would impact my wife and children. They had to be consulted, and they agreed that if it was the right choice for me, they would make the move to North Carolina work. In retrospect, we made a great decision. It's a fantastic experience here in North Carolina. So let's move on to the second question that's come through. How do you choose the best people for your team? Now, when I answer this, I'm answering in terms of hiring people for the C-suite, chief operating officers, financial officers, commercial officers. First, are they strategic? Are these folks who develop key customer insights, have deep customer insights and market insights that lead to strategies for growth for the enterprise? That's what I'm looking for. Second, decisiveness and ability to make decisions. Those who have a track record of decision making and accountability that led to de definitive performance statements stand out. Those who lead change and who take a systematic approach to change and actively engage all stake stakeholders around them to ensure success, these folks stand out. Those who grow others and have a track record of building strong teams and sourcing talent for the rest of the enterprise. Personal insight and adaptability, this might be the most important one at this level. Those who understand their motivators and subconscious drives and moderate their behaviors to the need of a particular leadership challenge, those are the folks that stand out. They're not only one way to succeed, they can adapt themselves. And last but not least, teamwork and collaboration. Those who put the enterprise interests over their own personal parochial interests and who can work with a diverse set of colleagues stand out. One benefit you have from attending Keenan Flagler is the training you've received on teamwork and collaboration. This will serve you well. Thriving in a matrix environment in these large institutions and big businesses is very challenging. If you're a natural collaborator and work well in team constructs, you're going to do great and you're going to be very successful. Now let's look at the typical derailers that I try to spot that drive me away from selecting people. First is an integrity lapse. Compromise on your integrity once and it's over. You'll lose all the credibility you need to lead. Stay true to your moral compass. I have zero tolerance on this front. There's absolutely no way to come back from an integrity failure. Lack of optimism. There's so many reasons not to do something. Some excuse why things won't work or didn't work. Great leaders are different. The world needs all of you to be optimists. You have to create. No resilience. I see too many budding leaders who are smart as a whip. They're well-trained. They have all the requisite knowledge and innate skills to lead. Yet they fold like a cheap suit when the pressure gets high and there's a failure. They point fingers and say it was someone else's fault and responsibility. How will you respond to failure? Can you get knocked down and get right back up take the lessons on and keep moving forward. That's what you need to do. The third question is, what other advice would I have for graduates? The first is, you can absolutely have a successful career and a successful personal life. If you think it's not possible, it's a myth. It's very, very possible. Don't compromise on this unless you consciously choose to. All my career decisions were joint between my wife and me. I've always been conscious of this balance and trade-off between work and family life. It is possible if you prioritize well. Second, as you gain new work experiences, make sure you stay in touch with the professionals that you most respect. One day you're going to wake up like I did and realize you have a really powerful 
advocacy, and professional network. But that network won't be there if you don't cultivate the relationships. You don't have to have a networking strategy where you go try to make a bunch of random connections that are acquaintances. The relationships that matter are the ones where you're working side by side with people. But stay in touch with them and cultivate those relationships. Don't neglect them. Think about the strength of your advocacy network and build it. In closing, I think about where you are in your career and where I was at the same time. I grew up in West Virginia by the railroad tracks in a steel mill town. My parents put themselves through night school after they had kids and pushed me to go to the best college I could get into. I got lucky enough to go to a great institution at Carnegie Mellon. I worked hard, I seized opportunities, and I competed well. I pursued productive achievement and deployed myself 100% to deliver value for the enterprises where I worked. I would argue you are as well positioned as I was at your age. What I have that differentiated me, you can have too if you want it badly enough. Integrity, grit, determination, a strong work ethic, an analytical mind, a strong desire to compete, and an intense focus on the priorities that matter most for my enterprise. Before I close out my talk, I want to touch on what might be the most important thing you need to think about as you rise up the leadership ranks in the future. The question is, what is your true north? What are your core principles? What is your personal philosophy? You will need to think about this so you have a consistent framework and a dependable framework for decision making. Don't fall prey to pragmatism. You need to be grounded in your own core principles and philosophy. My True North is heavily influenced by Adam Smith's writing on the theory of moral sentiments, by the objectivist philosophy of Ayn Rand, and the economic writings of Milton Friedman. I can summarize this as follows. I'm responsible for my own happiness. I expect no one to sacrifice themselves for me, nor me for them. Reasoning or analytical thinking is my means to acquiring knowledge. Facts are facts. Just wishing something to be a certain way doesn't make it so. Productive achievement is my highest moral aim. I believe in the virtue of justice. I cannot control another person, nor can I allow myself to be controlled by another. I believe in the virtue of prudence, the ability to foresee future implications of my actions, and the self-control to forego immediacy for the longer-term benefit. Think about this question for yourself. Read deeply about it. As you rise up the leadership ranks, you're going to get a tremendous amount of responsibility and power. Having a framework like this will serve you very, very well in this, this, gate, this frame. So to achieve real success and happiness, one must live a virtuous life. Chasing money and fame can be toxic. To quote Andrew Carnegie, my heart is in the work. Make sure your heart is in the work and not only the money or fame that comes from your work. I encourage you to go into the business world with full force, with great optimism, and with a desire to make an indelible mark. Stand out. Distinguish yourself. You have what it takes. You're well prepared. What mark will you make? Make it a great one. I leave you with a quote from Ayn Rand. Do not let your fire go out, spark by irreplaceable spark, in the hopeless swamps of the not quite, the not yet, and the not at all. Do not let the hero in your soul perish in the lonely frustration for the life you deserved and have never been able to reach. The world you desire can be won. It exists, it is real, it is possible, and it is yours. In other words, dream big and go for it. Thank you.